I don't know whether or not you consider yourself an environmentalist, but if you do, I wonder what kind of environmentalist you think you are, you aspire to be, and actually what kind of environmental movement you identify yourself with. So we can think of the traditional environmental movement in the U.S. And this movement, which was really active in the 1970s, had some incredible achievements. They got the Clean Water Act passed, the Clean Air Act passed, and the National Environmental Protection Act passed, all under the administration of President Richard Nixon. This environmental movement was based on what we call interest group politics. And the interest groups were what we call large membership environmental organizations. Organizations such as the Sierra Club, the Natural Resources Council, and the Audubon Society, among others. But interest group politics can become very adversarial. And we saw a backlash against the successes of this environmental movement in the 1980s under the Reagan administration. So those of you who are of a certain age may remember that Reagan appointed James Watt as Secretary of Interior. And James Watt put a whole lot of effort into trying to privatize our public lands, like our national parks. And then Reagan appointed Secretary of Energy Donald Hodel. And when Hodel heard about the environmentalists' concern about the, de the decreasing ozone layer and their concerns about possible impacts on skin cancer, he prescribed for Americans darker sunglasses and stronger suntan lotion. But we saw these kinds of adversarial politics playing out at the local level also. So one of the biggest controversies of the time in the 1980s was the loggers versus the preservationists in the Pacific Northwest who were concerned about the snowy owl and the old growth forest. And one of the things that some of the more radical environmentalists did was they would actually take a hammer and they would nail spikes into the remaining old growth majestic trees. And what they were intending would happen is that the loggers would then come by with their chainsaws, and their chainsaws would be ruined by these spikes, but also the loggers might have become injured themselves. But actions engender reactions, and the anti-environmentalists also did some pretty outrageous things. So there were, for example, incidents of anti-environmentalists shooting bullets into the offices of environmentalists. So basically what you had was gridlock. But people got tired of all the shouting, the shooting, and not making any progress. And one of the first groups, actually, to try and overcome this gridlock were loggers and environmentalists in the Pacific Northwest who had fought these very bitter, bitter battles over old growth forest. So they actually found neutral grounds in their towns and their communities like libraries. And they would get together and they would try to develop plans that would address the needs of the loggers as well as the environmentalists. And out of these kinds of uh, discussions emerged a new environmental movement, which is called civic environmentalism. Civic environmentalism, it reflects multiple players who are collaborating as part of an environmental movement. And in this way, it's kind of the environmental movement counterpart of polycentric governance. The political scientist DeWitt John has outlined four steps of civic environmentalism. And I'm going to use the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, which is about saving a treasured resource, as an example or a case study to illustrate these four steps. So the first one is about mobilizing social capacity. And in 1964, a group of Baltimore businessmen, and they also happened to be not just businessmen, but also recreational users of the Chesapeake Bay. So they were sailors, waterfowl hunters, and fishermen. And they were very concerned about problems looming on the Chesapeake Bay. Too many boats, too many people, too many houses, and inadequate sewage treatment. So they scheduled a meeting with their congressman, and they were hoping to seek his help. The congressman, the congressman whose name was Congressman Morton, responded that they couldn't expect government to fix all the Bay's problems. And Morton, Congressman Morton said, there is a great need for a private sector organization that can represent the best interests of the Chesapeake Bay. It should build public concern and then encourage government and private citizens to deal with these problems together. So essentially, these environmentalists slash businessmen and now slash civic leaders, they mobilized social capacity 
and they created the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. The second step is building collaborative processes. And some people who are actually engaged, not in the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, but in the old growth forest disputes and then later collaboration, talked about building collaborative processes these, this way. They said, it was desperation and gridlock that brought us together, but it was trust and respect that keep us going. So building collaborative processes works best locally because people have an attachment or a sense of place, a place attachment to a local resource. And it may not be something as large as the Chesapeake Bay. It may be a tributary, a small tribu tributary to the Chesapeake Bay. So also in, in local places, people know each other. And so the Chesapeake Bay Foundation actually consists of a network of environmental education centers and civic ecology practices and other activities like including oyster restoration, that are conducted at the more local level than the whole bay. The third step is garnering outside support. Well, the members of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation were very well connected. And actually, they had as one of their board of trustees, Senator Charles Mathias, a Republican from Maryland. And Mathias was able to garner the support of the EPA to conduct a seven-year study of the, of the Chesapeake Bay and its environment. The fourth step is getting plans implemented. In 1983, so nearly 20 years after those businessmen first went to Congressman Morton seeking help, the governors of three states in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, as well as the mayor of Washington, D.C., hammered out a Chesapeake Bay Agreement for Cleaning Up the Bay. So I'm going to summarize. What is civic environmentalism? Civic environmentalism is a new environmental movement that's an alternative to adversarial politics and the interest group environmental movement. It brings multiple voices to the table to seek collaborative solutions. And it's also part of a growing civic renewal movement that's focused not just on environmental issues, but also on social issues like education and health care. And finally, the movement kind of grows on itself. As communities take action, they build capacity for future action.